Welcome to Embedded. I am Elysia White, and I'm here with Christopher White. And welcome to the Don't Panic Geocast. I'm John Lehman here co-hosting another crossover show, and this week we've got special guest Dr. Eric Bruning. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Eric, since you're the guest, let's start with you. Could you tell us about yourself? Yeah, I'm a professor at Texas Tech University, uh, associate professor, and uh, I study uh, atmospheric electricity and lightning and how that relates to meteorology and, and the rest of the way the thunderstorm works. And you've been on our show before. We asked you many lightning-based questions for lightning round. You've also been on John's <laughs> show, right? I have, yeah. Been, uh, been on both and uh, glad to be visiting with you again. And let's see, John, since you aren't always on our show, um, could you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm John Lehman. I co-host the Don't Panic Geocast with Shannon Doolin. And I also run a small custom scientific and industrial instrumentation and automation company uh, creatively called Lehman Geophysical. So I, I couldn't decide what I wanted to do with life. So I stayed in school for as long as possible and ended up with a PhD in geoscience from Penn State. And spent a lot of time working in an experimental lab, which gave me lots of fun opportunities to play with things, do all kinds of hardware and software uh, hacking, if you will, and left academia, worked in software for a couple of years. And then my company got large enough to support me full time. So I've been doing that for the last few months. That's great to hear that it's going well. Thanks. Christopher, will you introduce yourself? Yeah. As though I didn't know you? <laughs> As though you didn't know me. <laughs> Well, I'm a pretty cool guy. Uh, no, um, I am an embedded software engineer, and I've done a whole bunch of different kinds of products, a lot of medical devices, a lot of medical imaging devices. So I've played with optical physics and things like that, and, and laser tissue interaction, which sounds about like you think it is. And I uh, formerly worked at uh, Fitbit more re recently, and now I'm back to consulting full-time. And yes, that's a change. You also have an advanced degree. I have a degree in physics, yes, a master's degree. I'm the least educated one here, but I wrote a book called Making Embedded Systems, and I am an embedded systems engineer, a consultant, and uh, let's see, a podcast, a book... An engineer. Two dogs and a pile of folded papers. Right, which we'll be talking about later. Before we get to that, uh, the real idea behind this show came up when we had Eric on our show, and it seemed like a lot of his gear, like his field gear, was made out of cookery. And I know that John and Eric have worked together quite a bit. And so I have a question for you both. Is this how physical science is done? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I was short. <laughs> All right. Show's over. <laughs> and we're done. Uh, will you tell me about things, times you did crazy things and got them to work or didn't get them to work? Sure. Uh, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start. Um, there's a an instrument that I flew as an undergraduate and a graduate student on uh, very large weather balloons uh, called a called an electric field meter, and uh, it, it does does what it says, measures the uh, electrostatic field inside thunderstorms. Um, and that uh, my my main memory of of doing work on that instrument was the the amount of tape that we used to hold the thing together, um, and uh, so that was everything from packing tape to uh, sort of create watertight seals between various foam pieces because the, you know, made, made a lot of the instrument out of foam because it was uh, needed to be lightweight, um, as well as uh, electric tape to uh, like regular high quality vinyl electric tape, uh, electrical tape to uh, hold together the two aluminum spheres that uh, did the actual sensing of the electric field. Um, and so, you know, you'd get an instrument back, tear it all off and, you know, fix any, uh, fix any damage, grab the data and, uh, tape it back up and fly it again. That sounds like a perfectly reasonable use of tape. <laughs> yeah, I don't think folks realize how much of science is accomplished with various forms of tape. Uh, all of the samples that we built in our lab to do earthquake studies started out with lots and lots of scotch tape. We bought it by the gross. 
and use that to contain our sample material and lots of razor blading scotch tape to very precise heights with titanium jigs and fun stuff. But at the end of the day, it was really just scotch tape. I think the tape in the medical device lab was always Kapton tape. I'm, I'm surprised you guys aren't just using that all over. The uh, the exotic one that we used in the uh, uh, in the electric field meter was a uh, uh, was a certain kind of conductive tape that uh, that 3M makes. There's probably other manufacturers too. Um, and uh, we were having uh, the, so there's a radio transmitter in the instrument, and it uh, it sends out uh, 400 megahertz uh, RF. And as you might imagine, uh, dangling an antenna out of the instrument in a hundred kilovolts per meter, you know, is maybe not the most uh, forgiving environment. And uh, we were trying to deal with some interference problems, and so uh, decided to encase the transmitter in a little metal tin, and then used this uh, this conducting tape to uh, uh, to create a a proper Faraday cage uh, across the individual seams in that in that case that we built. I have this idea of crossing chibitronics, you know, the little books you can buy and, and make like collages that are made out of this conductive tape and, uh, and weather balloons. (laughs) Is is that about right? I think that, I think that could work. Is it because you end up just having to improvise in the field and you, you have good plans, but as soon as you, have first contact with a real weather. (laughs) Or is it about the budget? Yeah, yeah. Which which is it? Is it just improvising because you didn't anticipate something or just it's, hey, this is cheap and it works? A lot of it comes from, uh, you know, every every few years when you go out and do another field experiment, you've tried to make some improvement to the instrument, which means you then, uh, as you said, are up there in the storm for the first time with that part and you have to, uh, to iterate on it a little bit. And so you need something that you can, uh, do quickly. You can't rebuild the whole instrument. Um, so that, that's part of it. Um, other parts of it is, is budget as well. And, you know, when you're, when you're doing things on, you know, uh, dozens at most scale, um, it's, it's not worth investing in some sort of, uh, uh, right. Hugely custom part. Yeah, no need to do vacuum forming and dye manufacturing with 10 units. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think a lot of these, you know, you don't always know if you're going to get a balloon-based instrument back. Uh, So you don't want to have something that's too expensive that you're going to put up in the first place. Uh, But a lot of these sort of low-quantity instruments, there are all kinds of little tricks to get them to work that resort in interesting field bodges. And because you are always modifying the instrument or you're in a different environment than you anticipated, uh, you know, nobody probably anticipated trying to deploy this thing from the back of a U-Haul truck with a big balloon like Eric was doing. Uh, but there's a lot of, you know, laying on of hands, sometimes literally to get these things to work. Yeah, that's right. The uh, laying on of hands was something we ran into with, uh, let's see, it was the which part of the electronics was it? It was, uh, oh, this was actually an earlier version before we switched to a different transmitter. Um, And uh, this was when we were running the RF signal out through the same spheres that did the uh, electric field sensing. And uh, there was some sort of capacitive thing that literally required for the instrument to start, for certain instruments, not all of them, for you to uh, touch the instrument and then it would uh, magically start working. (laughs) I've met so many of those devices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and usually it's me not touching them because I have this f- field around me that breaks electronics. But once I take them to Christopher, they work again. Is that true? Usually. I just swap them with a new copy. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> In grad school, we call that the advisor exclusion zone. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of grad school... um. You you got a PhD uh, is it two years ago now? Yeah, so uh, yeah, coming up on three years ago, pretty wow. soon that I finished. Time passes, and uh, you have a, a story about uh, bodging things as part of your PhD thesis. Oh, the, there were lots of bodges as part of my PhD thesis. The instrument that I worked on. Especially, it was called the Biax, and listeners of our show will be familiar with that. But it was just a two-axis large hydraulic press, 
And so each cylinder produced somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter million pounds force. Say, say that again? Oh, just a and, little. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And so we would put uh, rock samples in there, powder samples in there, and shear them to study their frictional properties and learn about how earthquakes work from that. Uh, and that whole machine was built on continuously because in research, you're always trying to do something new. So we would always need a new capability. So somebody would modify the control electronics. It was all servo hydraulic controls. Uh, but the, the first thing that came to mind when we talked about this is the hashtag overly honest methods on Twitter. It's a great one to go follow and look up sometime. Uh, because in all of my papers, you'll see me talk about impermeable plastic membranes that we use to humidify the samples. Uh, those are Ziploc baggies. <laughs> and uh, we, we did this because we started engineering this humidity a control chamber that was going to go inside. And we had all kinds of things that we were trying to do to seal where the, the pistons go through to exert force on our samples and a, a whole control methodology. And then we realized that just by using a simple chemical reaction in a Ziploc baggie, we could do the entire thing much cheaper and just as well. I once had a company come to me and they were having a bunch of trouble because they needed to have uh, many of their devices in their office working with all their engineers. <laughs> this and is so, a radio problem. So they had like 82 BLE devices all crowded together and they couldn't make anything work. And, uh, and they wanted help. They wanted software to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I'm pretty sure I can fix it. And if I come up there, it will cost some exorbitant amount of money because they were in San Francisco and I don't like to travel. Um, or I can just tell you, but you won't believe me. And uh, and they said, of course, they said, well, just tell us. And so I said, okay, you take you take the Amazon box you got today, the little one. You put your phone inside. You put your device inside and all of the debugging stuff. And then you wrap it in aluminum foil. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you do. <laughs> and it took them about two weeks before they seriously tried it. And they, they just kept fighting it and fighting it. And I said, well, have you tried, you know, the Faraday cage? And well, we don't think that's the problem. Like, have you tried it? <laughs> oh, yes. There are uh, several different places that I've gone where we were doing everything from high energy physics to just uh, like piezoelectric time of flight measurements and rocks. There's ample use of aluminum foil everywhere. Okay. So we have tape, uh, electrical tape and packing tape and scotch tape and aluminum foil as our things we must take to Mars. And, and Ziplocs. And, and Amazon boxes. <laughs> <laughs> what else is in your field kit, John? Uh, you know, I... I make use of a lot of five gallon buckets for housing things out of the weather. Uh, since we're doing sensing out in the environment, uh, these are one of the more inexpensive ways to keep your sensors and your electronics out of the weather. Uh, the first time I did this, we were actually deploying, uh, it was during my PhD, but not related, deploying some infrasound sensors out in the auspicious sounding experimental forest. Uh, which infrasound was in central sensors, Pennsylvania. <laughs> infrasound sensors are long wavelength sensors. And like some animals use infrasound to communicate, uh, like elephants and uh, crocodiles. What were you looking for? I, I don't recall there being either of those in Pennsylvania. No. So I was actually looking at uh, microbarums. So these are things like as the, the waves break on the coast, they create yeah. very small pressure fluctuations. So that sort of uh, 0.1 hertz or 10 second period signal. And we had some storms that were at that time com coming up uh, towards the eastern seaboard and going. And so we were using a little infrasound network and doing some fun things with uh, noise cross correlation on them. Uh, but, but we put these things in buckets, put them out. And the, the experimental forest was open to hikers. So we had to try to camouflage them a little bit so nobody got too curious. Uh, <laughs> so 
we ended up putting the. We we'll just put this branch over here. So Nobody not the, will not notice. the orange Home Depot. Yeah, it was a good... <laughs> right. Well, they were the orange orange uh, Home Depot buckets. That was the the problem, <laughs> and it, it was during deer season, so we had to have orange on when we were out there. You never know who's around hunting, but we uh, put these out and then dressed the orange buckets in camouflage t-shirts we got from Walmart and then bought a little <laughs> child's tent and put all of the recording electronics in that and draped it with uh, camouflage as well. So we had lots of Home Depot buckets and camouflage t-shirts in the forest. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> what about you, Eric? Do you, what do you have in your toolbox? Well, one of the one of the things we like to use a lot is uh, tie wraps and hose clamps and uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, the I, I run a lightning mapping network out here in West Texas, and when we were installing that, um, of course, you're uh, you know building relationships with local farmers and things because they have these nice big open fields with no noise, and uh, and so uh, you know we a farmer follows us along to do the install one day and uh, of course we've got a antenna up on a big pole and uh, coax cables running uh, down from the pole into our uh, electronics enclosure and of course you got to uh, get all that stuff uh, uh, held down in the the west texas wind somehow so um you know lots of uh, lots of tie wraps and, and hose clamps to to uh, get it all to stay right tight to the pole, and uh, we, I was I was proud. We got complimented by the farmer. Actually, said you know you you do great farming out here in West Texas because you got to make use of the materials you have to to get the job done. What about you, Christopher? You don't go in the field very much. Uh, yeah, I don't have a field kit. Sorry, <laughs> I'm a software developer. I have a toolbox. My field is my chair. <laughs> I have a toolbox. I just don't use it. <laughs> so, Alicia, what are some of the things that you carry with you everywhere when you're going to work? Uh, I have a multimeter uh, because, of course, the first thing you need to know about any piece of electronics that's broken is, uh, does it have power? And then there's the make sure it doesn't have power and then power it again. And the classic, have you turned it off and back on again? <laughs> Uh, tape, of course. Now that the logic analyzers are small, I usually have a logic analyzer too, um, just because you can throw it in. Uh, I have the good tweezers and I have the bad tweezers. The bad tweezers are regularly punished. Uh, what, uh, makes, what makes the bad tweezers bad? Because they are regularly punished by being used <laughs> as oh, little tiny pry bars. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, what else is really important to me? I mean, tape. I, I totally agree with tape. I have definitely electrical and probably duct tape. Although sometimes I put in packing tape instead of duct tape. Uh, although that does remind me, we were talking uh, at some point about uh, attaching instruments to vehicles. Um, and at one company... Uh, it, we were doing an inertial measurement unit and the quality engineer had gone flown out to see the customer. And I was on call to make sure that this very unhappy customer would get whatever they needed for software. And maybe I'd even go with them if, if it came to that. And, uh, the QA guy like landed and he couldn't have been there for more than five minutes before he called me and said, "Never mind, you don't have to come. And it turned out that what you really have to do to make an inertial measurement work is to tape it down so it doesn't tumble all over the vehicle. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah. Pictures worth a thousand words in situations like that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you have a four-wheeler and drone stories too, don't you? Oh, oh yeah. As a geophysicist, we were attaching... Uh, all kinds of instruments to four-wheelers for land-based things like magnetometers. Uh, so we're using a aluminum pipe and pipe clamps and plywood and mounting extra batteries on the front of this four-wheeler and then realizing we need to mount them on the other end so it doesn't tip over when we're going downhill because <laughs> of weight distribution. Uh, <laughs> using a lot of electrical conduit because it's easy to bend with a bender that you always have with you when you're doing things like this. 
to make nice little brackets and things. Um, on, on the drone side, it's really just been atmospheric profilers, and that's involving a lot of another kind of tape, uh, double stick tape. <laughs> <laughs> How do you put a magnetometer onto something with an engine with an engine and expect it to work? So you need to put it pretty far away. So we're okay. looking at a few meter long boom, which also makes going uh. up or downhill interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have this, How many this times have you knocked that you? boom off? <laughs> a, a few. <laughs> and it's generally something that's rather worrisome because there's a several thousand to fifteen thousand dollar sensor out at the end. So you want to design some sort of a weak point into the system. So maybe have a a piece of plywood that will break before the sensor breaks and bends your boom all up and ruins your day. Uh, In in field work, it's really important to remember that at the end of the day, when it's been 105 degrees outside all day, you sort of have, I've heard it referred to as field brain. Uh, Oh, yes. And you will mess up and you have to provide safe failure points for your system. I like that you have these extremely uh, unique and expensive sensors that you're attaching to vehicles and and generally integrating into systems with tape and plywood and buckets. And then doing donuts. Because, of course, once you have a (laughs) four-wheel dune buggy, you're going to do a donut. Well, of course. Uh, And and the meteorologists do this a lot, too. Uh, there, There were recently some... Uh, field experiments where you've got anemometers and temperature sensors and pressure sensors attached to vans and trucks and even semis that have radars on them. Hey, I've seen the the movie Twister. (laughs) Okay, sorry. A little bit different than that. And Eric's probably a a better one to speak here, but I I will just say that measuring pressure from a moving vehicle is a really hard problem. It definitely is. There's uh, uh, a colleague of mine at the, at the, uh, National Severe Storms Laboratory that uh, spent a lot of time working with uh, with uh, different arrangements uh, mechanically positioned relative to the airflow on the car and uh, let's see also uh, uh, different sort of housings that uh, surrounded the sensor um, for for pressure there's a uh, sort of two parallel plates that tend to work well uh, for the airflow through those. Um, other problematic things are things like uh, like temperature measurement. So you're going to get uh, you know radiative heating coming up off of the car and all sorts of other other effects. You want to make sure that you're really sampling the airflow. Um, and so a lot of that was actually done with uh, uh, PVC, uh, large PVC uh, plumbing uh, pipe, and uh, the sensors were then housed in that, and there was uh, a forced airflow through that to ensure that we were that the the measurement was unbiased. And how, how far off the vehicle was this? I just can imagine this poor temperature sensor on a boom going up. It's uh, pretty much right up above the roof, maybe okay. hanging out uh, a few feet ahead and you know, maybe three or four feet up above the, the car. There's a fun figure in a, a paper in the literature, actually, from when these were first being developed, I want to say in the late eighties, early nineties, where, uh, they, they actually took a, like a Ford Escort or something and put it in a wind tunnel and looked at the, the airflow around the car and how that interacted with the the sensor boom. I'm picturing a van with a horn, like, like a narwhal. (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, let's see, it sort of looks like a snorkel actually, the way the, uh, the, the PVC tube kind of sits up there. Thank you. And I needed a better picture. Snorkel's different. <laughs> yep, yep. And the uh, the anemometer is just high enough, you know, about a meter off the top of the vehicle, that if it is a minivan, it's just a little too high to go through a drive through Oh, man, that's like the worst. This was empirically discovered? Yes. <laughs> this was course. empirically discovered. <laughs> <laughs> I like that empirically discovered means, yeah, we damaged the roof of the van. <laughs> <laughs> Which, what you want to do is you want to have the uh, the VHF radio antenna that you use to do vehicle-to-vehicle communications taller than all of your instruments. So you hear that thing whack first and you know that you're, uh, you know that you're getting close. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how are parking structures? <laughs> <laughs> you avoid them, mostly. Yeah. Um, so what has been the most expensive instrument you've potentially damaged that you're willing to admit? 
<laughs> There's a lot of qualifications. There were, weren't there. <laughs> oh, that's tough. Um, because if you admit it, you're, you're going to be sanctioned or so, so there's how about too the... many to choose from. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> the, there's a, a gravimeter. So we measure tiny changes in gravity. You can tell differences in density of material below you because we're measuring gravity out to oh, you know, so six, cool. 10 decimal places. Uh, these are roughly $150,000 for a used instrument. And they're about the size of a little toaster oven, but they stand up on end instead of lay down like the toaster oven does. And when they are unlocked, they have a zero length quartz spring inside. Uh, so very delicate. And so when the mass is unlocked and you're actually taking a measurement or you haven't relocked it after taking a measurement, if it tips over, it's a several tens of thousands of dollars mistake. And we have had very close calls with uh, starting to have a, a little scree slope uh, disappear out from underneath us and us and the instrument start sliding down. And there were cut backs and cut arms, but the instrument remained upright. <laughs> I, I, I can, I'm, I'm imagining this right now, the desperate, <laughs> desperate scrambling around to make sure the instrument is up, but uh, it doesn't matter if we break our necks. It doesn't matter right. if our elbows are bleeding. <laughs> Get onto it. I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, that, that same instrument was later in that same field season involved in an incident where there was a hailstorm that required sheltering that might or might not have used the instrument housing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> checking the density of the human belief. Yes. Yeah, the uh, the instruments that, you know, I've I've largely worked with have been, uh, you know, maybe a little bit lower cost than that. And thankfully we haven't fried any, any of the uh, lightning mapping sensors. So that's been, uh, been a big plus, but, um, you know, one of the, uh, back to the balloon born electric field meter, um, you know, one of the big investments of, of, of cost with those is, uh, isn't just getting everybody out to the storm and, uh, you know, your whole crew and all of the travel involved, uh, just to get to the point where you can launch it. And, uh, this is one of those cases where you, you hope you've done all your bodges, right? Um, there was one particularly memorable occasion where we had, a um, one of the instruments flying in its normal orientation to measure the vertical electric field, and then had turned one of them on its side to measure the horizontal electric field. So we have this giant tens of feet long lash up of instruments that we're trying to chuck up into the sky. And uh, um, I, I guess we hadn't all read our Boy Scout manuals quite well enough, but uh, it, it got about uh, I want to say 30, 40 feet off the ground. And then the, uh, instrument chain, uh, spontaneously disassembled. And we had, uh, two very broken instruments on the ground. Spontaneously disassembled. <laughs> A red rapid unscheduled disassembly. Yes. <laughs> and, That's and the technical term. Yeah. And th these balloons are huge, by the way, that Eric's talking about. They're not a few foot in diameter weather balloon. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, they're manufactured by a custom outfit. I think the ones we got were from like somewhere up in South Dakota and it's a giant polyethylene bag. So a, a giant garbage bag filled with helium gas that you've uh, chased around the planes with and uh, gets inflated inside a U-Haul truck that also serves as a mobile shelter for, uh, for everyone. If there's uh lightning nearby. Why do they have to be so large or they're, they're not, I mean, they have the ones that go up to like, you know, Hundred thousand feet, but that's not the point here, right? Um, these do get up to a hundred thousand oh, okay. feet as well. Okay. We're going all the way up through the storm into the stratosphere, okay. but um, uh, hundred thousand feet might be overdoing it a little bit. But you know, sixty, sixty, seventy, somewhere in there. Um, uh, but they need to be big because the uh, instruments that we're flying are about four okay. four pounds or so. If they aren't rapidly disassembling, that's that's right. Yeah, I mean, then that's a massive increase in buoyancy and. Uh, you know, you get through the storm in a hurry, that, that flight. I just can imagine the report from this <laughs> massive increase in buoyancy. Uh, what did they, what happened such that it disassembled itself? Note the complete lack of blame on anybody. Yeah, it's, uh, I, my guess is that whatever not was chosen wasn't 
wasn't quite right. Um, to, so this was a Boy Scout manual figure. <laughs> it really was. Oh, it, it absolutely was. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a book of knots that was part of the research group that, you know, everyone sort of sat down with and learned how to tie a knot. So the knot sat in the right place. So the instrument would be balanced and, and all of that. I thought you had zip ties because, or, or is the zip ties to reinforce the knots now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zip zip ties. Let's see, we, I don't think we used any for that. Um, yeah, the it, the primary rigging was a like was a waxed nylon line, and you need waxed nylon because it uh, it you don't want it to absorb water and become conductive. So there's all sorts of interesting you know interesting things when you're up in that electrical environment. All of which have been discovered by trial and error. I say. Empirically. <laughs> <laughs> Empirically is the word. <laughs> am I, am right. I to assume um, that several went up with non-waxed <laughs> line at some point? <laughs> so that was that was before my time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the the measurement dates back to before my birth. Um, so you know, I I inherited from my my advisor what uh, he inherited from his advisor, and uh, science advances. I like that this whole this whole collection of tribal knowledge and lore associated with doing these field experiments that aren't aren't necessarily part of you know, the scientific literature. It's like, this is how we take these measurements. And it's not written in your paper that you took all these steps to, to get this all to work. It's just stuff passed down from advisor to advisor. No, you get a rapid increase in, in buoyancy. And yeah. it's your advisor that explains what happened. I, I know, but, but, <laughs> but there's no manual for this. No manual for decoding you guys what have science a, actually happened. you guys have a, a, a wiki that you put all this stuff up on for posterity? <laughs> You know, there probably should be. Uh, I, I think in the past, method sections of papers really got cut because you wanted to get as much in about the research, the cool thing that you discovered as you could. So when you started hitting up against that length limit for a specific journal, methods were the first things that got knocked out. And so I think sort of it comes from that. And that's starting to change as people are doing more supplemental material. But even in lab work, there is a lot of this, we do it this way because it took us five years to figure out that this is the best way to do it that we found so far. But we keep trying new things, too. I mean, that happens. Yeah, that everywhere. happens everywhere. I mean, in, in my lab work, which is just a couple of computers, we had built up a, a large store of voodoo, and I spent a week killing the voodoo. But that was just... Because somebody discovered that if you typed A and then B and then C, it worked. And I'm like, yeah, those things shouldn't matter. Order should not be dependent. Here, let me try it all the different ways and verify that you can stop circling the computer twice clockwise in order to make it work. <laughs> so at some point, knowing that your uh, devices are made of tape and very expensive. And hope. Uh, instrument, very expensive sensors and, and hope. Uh, do you worry about the accuracy of your field bodges? That's what the instruments are for. Well, I mean, I've, I've definitely gone, you know, with ShotSpotter, we would go out and take uh, data, which is to say we would go fire large weapons at various locations. And some of the field bodges... Yeah, in, in various locations. In various, not at, in various <laughs> okay. locations. I just want to make that clear. Sorry. Uh, yes. Oh, and speaking of field bodges there, that was the time that I needed duct tape to keep my Truth. hiking boots together. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, accuracy. Accuracy. I definitely have been in the field where accuracy suffered because we figured out that tape was the only thing we could do. I mean... As long as it's a calibrated budge, that's probably going to be pretty good. And I, I know that, you know, just a few weeks ago, I believe, uh, you said everything's a temperature sensor, some things sense other things too. Yes, uh, I love to and, say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's very true. And it, it's the same with a lot of our instruments. As long as you calibrate it and calibrate it against all of the things that we can conceptualize that have major impacts on it, maybe being a bodge isn't necessarily a bad thing. Some of these stay in place for years. Uh, the, the machine I did all my grad work on, that big uh, hydraulic press, 
it was bodged over and over and over for around 30 years. They were the original schematics, but they were almost completely unintelligible because of all of the markings that were dated from late 80s and early 90s and mid 90s and late 90s and early 2000s. And eventually it did become a problem. So we just recently finished redoing it completely. So now it's clean and bodge free, and that'll probably last for maybe 12 months uh, before somebody wants to try something totally new and they have to add something else on. So I, I don't worry necessarily about the accuracy unless it's something that we've bodged something where it's going to have some kind of time dependent thing. And I've even seen people try to calibrate that out. And I think it's at some point you get to a point like that with a lot of instruments where you have a, a maintenance procedure or, a, or an, an engineering approach that, uh, you know, that, that gets the job done and until the budget allows you to do it right. So, for instance, our lightning sensors that are out in the field right now have been there uh, closing in on 10 years and, uh, you know, thermal expansion and whatnot uh, gets after the uh, some socketed chips that uh, that are part of the. Uh, digitization circuitry and uh you know the 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 maintenance approach for that right now is you send a guy out there with a chip puller to reseat the the socketed chip and this is of course not particularly pleasant for the whoever has that job but um you know compared to replacing a ten thousand dollar board or whatever that's uh um you know preferable for a time but that's something we're certainly looking at now in the next uh next year or so is to try and get that get that replaced to a uh proper soldered uh, situation. In a lot of these instruments, you know, I said they were in service for a long time. You would not believe the number of labs that I walk into to work on equipment. And when you open up the control panel for this, there's uh, a Z80 in there running, or I have seen a couple labs where an Apple IIe was communicating with an instrument still because it works. We're not going to update the instrument. And there have been a few bodges along the way. I mean, that seems... Very reasonable, as long as they're keeping up with updates to their operating system. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the last security patch for the 2E is a little out of date. <laughs> <laughs> How does it go from a bodge to a device? How does what triggers the engineering? Is this like, oh my god, we got a grant and now we can finally do this right, or? This is so broken. We you're cannot. You're not doing it right. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> doing it better, right? Better, better. <laughs> Less human cost in the future. I mean, Eric is somebody who has to go out and find this grant funding. That's probably kind of a, a great question for you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a mix of uh, you know trying to be frugal so that if. Um, small things break, you can replace them properly at the time. Um, but, you know, for, from larger pieces of equipment, um, there's a, a mix of, um, you know, opportunistic allocation of, of, uh, grant money that comes in as well as, you know, trying to, you know, seek out grants that will, uh, you know, will allow you to make the replacement or repair that you would, uh, you would like to make. But how do you decide how do you decide that's how you're going to use your money? I mean, you only get so much money in grants and you have to pay people to go out to the field. So at what point do you say it is better to pay for this to be rebuilt and do the same thing it does right now, or maybe just a little better versus we're going to use this one more time and we're just going to make it work, add some more tape and it will be fine. Yeah, I think, you know, I think with this, this board that we're about to replace in the lightning sensor, um, you look at the amount of time the technician is having to spend and, and, uh, the amount of time it takes him to go make that replacement. And it's pretty easy to come up with a cost benefit analysis that it's, it's worth doing the, the change to the instrument, um, it, it, to, to save him all that time. But, um, you know, in other cases, there's there's painful uh, decisions that sometimes have to be made. Where like, well, we're just not going to make the measurement anymore, and we'll we'll move on to a different, um, you know, a different science question that uh, you know uses a different instrument that we have that uh, 
you know, we can, we can afford to run right now. And that's I, maybe a bit of a painful truth about doing research in this kind of a setting. Or even sometimes just the, the part for that instrument or the company that made that instrument originally is gone. And so when that instrument reaches end of life, you're done with that line of research. That's got to be really painful. Yeah, there are a lot of different instruments uh, out in the field that when they cease working, uh, there are going to be some major pain points. Uh, or when they have firmware issues, uh, like the recent GPS Epic rollover that affected so many seismometers, uh, and there's nobody there to update it. Did it really affect that many? I mean, I heard it was happening and I was like, okay, so only a few things are going to matter because most people handle that fine. Most people aren't upgrading their seismometers every year, <laughs> right? I mean, well, yes, these are old yeah, instruments I mean, that were huge capital expenses at one time and, and they're supposed to work forever. Right. And so they should be designing in the Epic rollover. Except it wasn't it was like this was the first one. probably 1998 when they were made. I, I'm yeah, speaking early for to you. Mid-90s what is the issue? The, <laughs> no, so I mean, I, I would say you're exactly right. Probably early to mid nineties is a lot of the vintage that, uh, got affected by this. And I'm not going to say the vast majority of the seismic network because it wasn't, uh, but there were definitely some older stations that have been kind of standby solid stations where, yeah, this instrument was put down a borehole and it's been there for 30 years and nobody's touched it. And then suddenly it has major issues on April 6th. And I guarantee you the people who made it weren't thinking, well, this is going to be in use in 2020. Well, they were oh, just no. <laughs> so excited to have any GPS at that point. Right. <laughs> Okay, so have there been times that the bodges have worked better than the engineered instruments? I mean, have there been times when you went back to the old hacked up system and said, oh, that actually gave us better data? Hmm. Uh, I'm going to say not in the long term. There have been times where we've tried it the, the new, the improved, the fancier, the engineered way. And we didn't get as good of a result, and we had to go back and figure out what about our bodge was different than what we were doing now and why it was not better when we knew it should be. Uh, in, in the rock mechanics lab, a lot of times that came down to uh, a signal, in, signal integrity issue or a pressure sealing issue uh, or something like that that we just hadn't thought of or hadn't realized that our bodge was helping when it, it was actually having an effect on that thing that we didn't even initially consider in our redesign. Yeah, I think that that's that's always a concern when you have a when you have a tested uh a tested design that you have a lot of miles on um and you know let's say you uh you switch out your your prop and vein anemometer to a um a, a newer like ultrasonic or resonant cavity type anemometer that uh is now measuring the wind in this totally different way and uh you know your old one works well in this um this old environment other than like maybe a little water intrusion problem on one of the boxes but um so you switch to this new one thinking it'll it'll solve all those problems and a lot of times you don't know until you're back out in the field uh whether or not that investment you've made to to change, uh, to modern technology, uh, was, uh, you know, was fully worth it. That's, and that's how we lead to having tape in our toolboxes to find out that now the field is different. <laughs> Whoops. I, I understand that. Um, and I, I, when I am engineering something, when I'm building something, sometimes with software, I get irritated when I have to take a step back and deal with my build tools. Um, Cause it's just one of those things that I don't enjoy. Do you do either of you, both of you get frustrated when you have to stop doing science and take care of the engineering? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can certainly speak to that from recent, uh, recent experience. <laughs> I, uh, so I, I wrote this code as a, as a postdoc, uh, you know, 10 years ago that uh, I thought was for my own research purposes. And there's uh, now essentially operational processing running on this code for, uh, uh, for the geostationary lightning mapper instrument. And it's processing, uh, processing those data and delivering images to the national weather service for their operational use. And so um, that's become a bit of a, of an engineering burden on the, the software side where I now get like trouble tickets filed by someone in Washington, DC. And uh, you know, it's like, I, I'm diving back into whatever 
uh, you know, nine year old, uh, nine years ago, me wrote and uh, trying to to excavate my logic from from that point in time. It's thoroughly unit tested, though, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> As in, it worked on my unit. <laughs> In fact, that was one of the bugs that I had to fix. The uh, the data that I take in decided to change its units from uh, square meters to square kilometers. And uh, so that was one of the hot fixes that had to get written real quick is like check to see if unit, if not, re- or if not rescale. The new definition of unit tests. <laughs> well, I mean, unit is a, a one thing, right? So I've always thought of unit tests as it worked once. And you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking the rules. Yeah. And I mean, I'll say I don't really do science anymore other than as a hobby when something cool happens and I'll go pull some data and look at it. I mostly do now the, the engineering things to help scientists do what they need to do. And so they don't have to do the engineering things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, hardware, it, with software, you can actually write tests with hardware, it's hard to write a test for, does this instrument measure the same thing that the other instrument did? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's a really interesting challenge. Uh, and as now we're getting more and more advanced sensing methods, we're able to store and process more data. Uh, and now we're measuring things just because we can, not necessarily because we, we know that we need to measure X, Y, and Z. Well, now we have the capability to measure uh, A and B as well for very little more cost. Uh, we're doing that, which introduces complexity to the system. And that's been a fun problem to grapple with. Yeah. Uh, some of my clients say they they need an accelerometer or, or we, we determine that what they need is an accelerometer for what they're doing. And then they look around and it's like, oh, well, but we can get gyros too for the same cost. And, you know, the magnetometers aren't that much more. We'll get that too, just in case we want the data. And now they've got 3x the data they have to store, and they're suddenly wanting quaternions and Kalman filters. With all they really needed was an ex- a tilt sensor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's so—I mean, these sensors are amazing, and they—they just—it's easy to want more. Are there sensors that you've been working with, John? I mean, IMUs have been out forever. So, are there new sensors? Uh, nothing that a, a novel, totally new thing comes to mind. Uh, you know, Eric mentioned doing ultrasonic measurement of wind speed now, so we get to deal with some of that. Uh, but more so just now we're everything, we're measuring all of the state variables that we can about our lab or our, our atmosphere. I've been dealing a lot recently with displacement measurement and very precise displacement measurement. So using eddy current sensors, capacitive displacement sensors, and a few of the older DCDTs and LVDTs, the little variable uh, transformer sensors. And so those all have their own challenges. They all do things a little differently, have different bandwidths. And a lot of times the, the scientists may not know exactly what they're looking for. They I want to subject my material to these boundary conditions and see what happens. So if you say, well, well what, what's the maximum frequency that you expect? <laughs> uh, it's unknown at the time, maybe because there's not a model that can accurately reproduce that. So we don't know exactly what to expect. Uh, so some of it's sensor challenge. Some of it is not knowing what we're trying to sense challenge. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were at the Imbari open house. Uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and they were talking about uh, their benthic event detection system and how they thought they knew what they needed. And uh, and yet when they had an event where this little rock-like thing was carried Which is the sensor. by mud yeah. um, down the canyon it went so much faster than they expected and it had so much more force than they expected. But I mean, you're going, you're going down under the sea. What, what do you, I don't know what's down there. Now we know a little bit more, but it would have been nice if it hadn't broken. (laughs) Right. And next time you can design it and, you know, we'll iteratively, iteratively sort of find, find that point. But a lot of times you, you don't know what to expect. You don't know what the conditions are or the thing that you completely didn't think about, uh, like we, some of our tilt meters. So I, I make very, um, micro radian and sub micro radian 
tilt meters for geophysical tilt applications. And some of them went down to Antarctica. And we had to think a lot about things like, how does the cable respond to temperatures that it's going to experience there? Does it get really stiff? And then when it gets windy, is that now stiff cable going to telegraph too much vibration to our sensor? Uh, so there's the thing that you need to sense, and we didn't know really how big what we were trying to look for there and the tilt signal was. And then we also had this whole other host of things that weren't what we were trying to sense and we're trying to keep out. And they included things like what happens to cables and zip ties at minus 30. So what do you do? Go down and get some dry ice and really chill up your lab? Or how do you, how do you figure it out? Yeah, so I actually uh, went eBay searching, one of my favorite things to do, and looking for bits of scientific equipment. And we bought a thermal chamber. And we put these things in a thermal chamber that would go down to minus 60. And so we just had a bunch of cable samples in there and then took them all out and started whacking them on the table to see which ones got the least rigid after being exposed to those temperatures. Then we would put the instrument in and calibrate it at these different temperatures. Uh, Just the, the things that you end up having to figure out that you never dreamed of. Do you have to do similar things, uh, Eric? Because, I mean, a balloon going up to 60,000 feet, that's a harsh environment as well. It is. uh, There was uh, my first job as an undergraduate was to uh, take these uh, motors that drove the the, uh, spinning apparatus, uh, the the measurement works because these uh, by inducing charge on this, these spheres as they spin in the electric field. And so, uh, you know, this motor has got uh, grease in it to lubricate it, and uh, that's designed for you know sitting in a, a manufacturing floor somewhere at uh, roughly room temperature. Well, that grease gets awfully stiff when it goes up to uh, minus 40, minus 60 Celsius. So um, my first job was to disassemble all of those motors and all their, their little gears, degrease them, and uh, put in some sort of low temperature oil that would, uh, would work uh, way up high in the sky. Seems inefficient couldn't you just order them the way you wanted them or is this this because they're they're people make these things but they don't make the 10 you need you know i'm not sure i i have not gone back to look if you could find a spec sheet that would give a a temperature rating on a motor like that um sometimes the you know, to find something with that kind of uh, specification listed on it, um, it's actually cheaper to just pay an undergraduate to do the work and, uh, uh, you know, or, or do the work yourself and uh, wind up, uh, you know, just taking care of it that way. How are ultrasonic wind sensors different than what I usually think of as an anemometer? Uh, no moving parts. So um, the anemometer, literally, uh, literally, you have a, a prop or a cup that's spinning. Um, the u- ultrasonic is uh, has a uh, has a speaker that sends out an ult- ultrasonic sound wave, and then a microphone that detects that sound wave. And a lot of those, um, you you can do that in such a way that you can even do a three dimensional wind measurement and a wind measurement at a much faster rate, up to say fifty hertz in some cases. Um, so. Um, no moving parts, which is nice, and um, uh, you know maybe some different issues to deal with in terms of uh, you know like electrical environment and and things underneath a thunderstorm that uh, uh, might cause a little different kinds of interference on your measurement. Okay, I'm I'm not understanding when I think of ultrasonic things going out and sounds coming back. I, I'm thinking like bats and echolocation and that sort of thing, but that wouldn't work on wind. Would it? Right. So do I understand how the measurement works well enough to explain this? This is interesting. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to quiz you. I- <laughs> no, uh, no, it feels like I should, right? I have a, there's a tower that we, that we run that has uh, uh, 10 of these up to 200 meters in height. So and then the um, realization, I should know. This can't work. This has never <laughs> worked. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's just noise we've been measuring all these years. Um, but at very high bit depth. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. And at 50 hertz. So it's a many hard drives full of noise. Um, how does that work? I'm going to have to go do some reading after, after we're done recording, I think. Um, 
it's uh but it's it's definitely a speaker and a and a receiver type setup and it might it might be something similar to like a doppler uh doppler type process where um where the the signal is is shifted uh because because the medium that it's traveling through is moving that makes sense okay so i i think some of them use doppler and then there's some of the cheaper in quotes that are sub several thousand dollar sensors. I, I think they just use time of flight difference and assume that the sound is advected by the medium. Oh, okay. But what are they bouncing off of? I mean, is it, they have to, are they bouncing off of something? So they emit, they emit in one spot and then the sound is carried by the, the air. Uh, oh, so there's air in between them. It's not right. that it's bouncing off and seeing a car in front of you. It's bouncing off. It's casting, it's not it. It's actually casting bouncing it into off. the air and then it's measuring the difference. Okay. So it looks more like a capacitor or a... Because you know the speed of sound, right? For the given conditions, probably. And then you, you hope so. Humidity being what it there's is. There's some additional... And, and temperature. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 0.3 meters per second per degree C. Yeah, so a lot of these actually look like um, two sets of three fingers that are staring at each other across a maybe one foot gap or something like that. Okay, I have a much better picture. This makes sense to me, and and Doppler and Shift both make sense. Okay, that makes so much more sense than what I had in my head. Uh, John, I hear you've been putting sensors on cows. Uh, yeah, so one of the the fun things about making sensors for scientists now is they come up with lots of interesting things they want to measure. And one of the more recent jobs that just came in was we want to measure the jaw motion of a cow. And we want to track this cow and then telemeter that data back. And so we're looking at doing some various piezo sensing <laughs> methods, but uh, I never uh, dreamed sorry of interrupt. sitting. She's, a... she's over here pantomiming with her jaw, being a cow for some reason, and I, I, I just thought everyone should know. Well, it's it's not something that I ever dreamed that I would have these, uh, these you know, little PCBAs with a, a programmer and debugger hooked up to them, connected to a, a harness for a cow sitting on my desk, and then the like, cow sitting the on her desk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> but actually, that leads me to an actual question: How do you prototype this? You don't have a cow in your lab, presumably. And tell me if you do. He, he does like. eBay. I don't know. I know he has trouble not buying things on eBay. <laughs> right. No. So there, there's no cow in the lab. I, I did get a building, and it does have a nice little, you know, courtyard area that's fenced in. But I have not put a cow out there for this contract. Uh, so in this case, I'm just moving the harness around and making sure that I record a faithful, at least what I think is probably faithful, uh, representation of the motion that I put in or the accelerations that I put in. And then he's been Zeller, doing the chewing cow thing too. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to, they're going to actually put this on the animal and That's uh, good. do yeah. the testing that way. Yeah. Well, how do you find people who need these sorts of sensor solutions. They find him. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a difficult thing because there's not a lot of people that do just the sensing side and sort of, and if it's in the geoscience side, I can know enough about what they're trying to do scientifically to make some intelligent decisions about what we need to do on the electronics and the hardware side. In the cow case, I'm learning along with them on what's the best way to detect jaw motion. Uh, but so people find me a lot through other work that I've done. So they, they've talked to somebody that's used products that I've developed for them, uh, or they'll, they'll ask somebody to conference and somebody's heard of that. I do these kind of things. It's a very boutique group of folks. Uh, it's a, a small niche, but it's one that I really enjoy working in because it's a different problem. Uh, not quite every day, but it's a different problem pretty often. And there's a big need for it because a lot of times the scientists are, they're writing grants, they're managing the actual project, they're doing data analysis, they're working with their grad students. 
they don't have time to figure out what changed in the latest version of whatever CAD program or figure out where their PCB layout went wrong and why they're getting massive crosstalk between these signals. And that's where I come in and take that work uh, away from the research groups and let them focus on the research that they enjoy. And I focus on supporting the science, which I found out I enjoy more than actually doing the science. That sort of thing is really a, a godsend to have access to because, uh, uh, you know, again, deploying our lightning sensors in the field, I had come up with some sort of uh, elaborate tripod design and spent a whole bunch of my time trying to come up with this. And uh, we have a, a, a technician on our staff here who previously had a career as like a, a, a welder in, in Alabama and uh, then did some uh, engineering support for uh, uh, the V-22 Osprey uh, helico- tilt rotor helicopter aircraft. And uh, anyway, lots of uh, lots of experience. And so I described my problem for him, to him, you know, what, what I wanted to have done. And um, he goes to bed uh, overnight and said, yeah, I woke up this morning and I think I can get some steel and be about $500 and I'll get do all 12 of your sites and it'll be all done. Uh, just, you know, give me a, give me a credit card and I'll, I'll go get started. So um, it's, it's fun to have uh it makes the resource more fun when you have a team that can uh, can take on some of those uh, those ingenious mechanical and uh, and electrical or whatever you need uh, kinds of projects. And they enjoy it. I mean, you enjoy doing the science, and they enjoy doing the engineering. Everybody's happier than when you're swapped. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right, and I, I mean it's it's really delightful to watch people with with expertise that I don't have doing the the thing that they're good at, and so uh, a, d- a diverse team from from all walks of life can be really uh, really useful. You have mentioned the global lightning mapper. Um, could you tell me more about what that is? Yeah, it's. Uh, Everyone's familiar with uh, the weather satellites that NOAA launches. Um, they're the ones that give you the pictures of the clouds that you see on the evening news. And uh, the most recent series of these um, that uh, that NOAA designed and uh, uh, and, and launched uh, a couple of years ago uh, now have a, a lightning sensor on it. And the way this thing works is it looks for um, the optical pulse of lightning uh uh, produced um, even against a bright cloud top, and so uh, you might imagine there's a very uh, very sensitive CCD and some some interesting electronics that uh, that go into extracting that very tiny signal against a bright sunlit background, and it does that well enough that um, it's about seventy percent of the lightning seventy um, uh, percent of the, the lightning flashes that are um, created are, are detected. And there was something about. CCDs and meteors that I should ask you about. Yeah, so uh, it turns out that when you when you design a sensor that's uh, good at detecting small optical pulses that uh, are are transient, um, the that same sensor is very good at looking at uh, meteorites when they re-enter the atmosphere and explode. It's called a called a bolide when it does that. Um, sometimes these are very very bright, but they uh, you know they come in all all shapes and sizes. Um, and there's been uh, probably dozens now that have been seen, uh, you know, since the, uh, since GLM was launched and the, the bolide community is very excited about this because they have a, uh, um, a whole new hemispheric scale data set to look at, to, uh, uh, try and build up a, a sense of what, for instance, the size distribution of these meteors are and the, the energy with which they reenter the atmosphere. Um, even things like the, uh, the light curve, um, as the the bolides re-entering and um, heating up and then e- exploding, um, that uh, this lightning sensor runs at uh, at 500 hertz, and so there's uh, uh, you know some detail there in that light curve that they can retrieve. Did you expect it? I don't think so. I, I know I certainly didn't personally. And then uh, someone came to our uh, instrument science team meeting from uh, from a bolide group, and uh, they were. They were very excited, and uh, and uh, so it's been been to a couple more meetings with those folks. And uh, as John was kind of saying before, it's it's a it's fun to um, you know get to learn about these these new areas that uh, that you come across in the course of the work. 
Yes, I, that's one of the best things for me as be, being a consultant is getting to just learn about all of the things and see what's working and learning about the different technologies and then finding a client who needs a technology that they didn't know and being able to say, oh, no, you don't really need to hire me. Just buy this entirely finished product. <laughs> and it's, I don't know. I like doing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Geocast does this thing with papers. John, could you introduce? The segment. The segment. Yes, the segment. Right. So as our listeners will know, it's time for everybody's favorite segment of the show, Fun Paper Friday. And in this segment, we select a academic in nature paper and find some interesting connections that it makes to the real world, or it's just a bizarre paper. And in this case, Alicia, you picked a really interesting paper for us. Uh, yes. I, I mean, it was interesting to me. <laughs> um, so there's a, a guy named David Huffman and for, in, for software engineers or embedded engineers, this is Huffman of Huffman encoding, um, which is a, a good way to make things a little more dense and, and to make sure you have good error checking. So I can link to Huffman encoding, but that's not the, what he's famous for in this paper. Um, Eric Domain and a couple of other authors, uh, although I know Domain did his uh, PhD research on this, wrote about Huffman's work in curved crease models. This is origami. And when you fold something in half with a straight line, you get a, a piece of paper that is now flat again, right? But if you, instead of a straight line, you draw a U on it with a, a, say a ballpoint pen and you write really hard so that you, you get a pre-crease so that it, it, it will fold along that line. If you fold that, it becomes 3D. It becomes a curve and it has to be 3D. You can't fold it into a flat piece of paper again if you are also folding this curved line. And that one U in a piece of paper is the tiniest piece. That's addition. And he's doing advanced calculus uh, with this amazing stuff. Yeah. And I had never heard of this before, <laughs> before you sent this paper over. And it was really fascinating. The, the different, pretty much conical sections that he used to make these uh, shapes. And in the paper, they sort of go through building up to more complex shapes by taking these. And they said he used this little sort of a circle spring-loaded pin tool, uh, like you said, kind of sort of like a ballpoint pin and vinyl to do this. Uh, but in the paper, the authors do it with normal paper. They also replicate his method and they do some simulations, some solid modeling uh, as well to try to understand exactly how some of these worked and just sort of play with the advanced math. And it is math. I mean, if you just do like the U curve will work because you'll get some shape out of it, but there are many things you can do that don't work and you can just end up with a crumpled ball of paper. Trust me, I know. Uh, and yet there's one here that looks super hard called tessellations that you end up with uh, ellipses that go in and out of a paper. And I folded it and it, it actually it wasn't that bad. You just have to do the creases. He uses the pin tool. I, I actually use a metal uh, mechanical pencil without the lead in. And a lot of people say that ballpoint pens work. Uh, and it, if you, if you let it fold the way it wants to fold, it curves and the paper moves. And at the end, you, you have something that doesn't look like paper. I encourage people to go look at this because Elise has been doing this and it's kind of, it's it just these weird things that you don't think paper should be able to do. And that sounds kind of <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, but, uh, when you see these, it's, it's, you think it's like, uh, 
cast plaster of Paris or something with intricate uh, curvilinear designs built into it, but it's just paper that once you score it a certain way and manipulate it, it just kind of wants to be in this new shape, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, it looks very sculptural, like uh, like something you might even see, you know, attached to a building at great expense and, uh, you know, cast in concrete or something. And, um, you know, they, they provide templates in the paper, it looks like, that you can just kind of trace out. I, I, I haven't done this yet, and maybe Alicia can, can clarify, clarify if I'm right on this, but basically you just trace along these lines and then the, the shape sort of pops out. Yeah, there are little dashed lines and then dashed dots. And one of those should go in and one of those should go out. And if you're going to choose one, there's one that makes a flower called inflated vertices or a, sort of a swirl. Or, what would you call it, Christopher? A uh, pinwheel kind of thing? Yeah. That one yeah. is probably the easiest one of the ones I've tried. Okay. And it gives a really satisfying result. So have you just been doing this with like printer paper or do you use special paper or do you use vinyl? What what have you found that works well? I have origami paper and I have to say it does not work that well. You want to use something a little thicker. Um, If you have resume paper around, you know, the nice stuff, Uh, printer paper won't work that well, but it will work enough. I mean, it's enough to, to do a basic U shape. Um, Cardstock's a little heavy, but it works. Uh, And Weirdly, construction paper, cheap construction paper works pretty well. Uh, but it has to be something that when you push down on it, you can feel the line, but you aren't ripping the paper. Okay. Hmm. So he said in there that the vinyl that he used was 10 thou thick. So I guess it's time to pull out the uh, calipers <laughs> and go to the craft store. <laughs> I've had pretty good luck on anything that feels beyond thin paper. Like, it doesn't have to be super thick, but it, it shouldn't be, wow, this is really cheap paper. Okay. And so looking at some of these shapes, some of them look very not natural, like the tessellations. Though I guess in, you could sort of think of it as a Horst and Graben structure in geology, but that's not what it would really look like. Uh, some of these things, to me, looked geological in shape. Like, I could see uh, an alluvial fan up in figure three, uh, or some of these things, I'm wondering how much of a connection there would be to things like plate boundary collisions or geological folding, because you're getting some really strange shapes from something that was effectively a flat sheet. That was why I wanted to suggest it, because it seemed very much like that. And if you if you look at that uh, pinwheel one, if you add some more lines, which aren't on here, it ends up looking kind of like a mountain if you add enough lines in there and it it becomes this very craggy mountainous shape. And I was like, okay, so is that how mountains work? Yeah. And just looking, like I said, at some of these, it really does to me look like a geological folding or a plate boundary collision, which would make those mountains. You're taking this solid thing and forcing it into a three-dimensional shape. So I would imagine that some of the mathematics overlaps pretty heavily. This is more of a structural geologist's area, uh, but I could definitely see some plunging folds that looked like this. And I was wondering with those even, if you've got different strata and you bend it, sometimes you can get movement in between some of those different units effectively faulting. So would that be like doing this with a stack of paper where the sheets can move and slide on each other so that you can have these uh, sub-parallel faults and then you're forcing this into a more complicated shape even then. A lot of these uh, these complex shapes that that sort of pop out of what seems like a simple structure into, into three-dimensional space reminds me of a, uh, of a guy I follow on Twitter uh, named Henry Segerman, who's a uh, also a professor at Oklahoma State, and uh, his Twitter feed is full of all these uh, sorts of unusual mathematical objects. I've come across uh, videos of um, that someone's put together of actually like flying through hyperbolic space as well, which is one of the conic sections. And there's a bunch of conic sections in these uh, paper folding things. Um, and so it's a uh, he seems to have a lot of neat work about uh, you know how to take these. Uh, maybe, maybe I wonder if his, some of the stuff he studies is related to the mathematics behind this paper folding even. 
So far, it's been computer scientists and mathematicians that seem to be studying it or even doing it in their free time. Um, I agree with the, I mean, the time of arrival and the hyperbolas makes sense because you're fitting least, uh, least what curves? Uh, least, uh, like a sphere is the least amount, least area. Right, right. I'm sorry. There must be words. There must be words. It's a minimization problem. <laughs> it is a minimization problem. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually solved as a, as a least squares minimization problem. Yeah. And many of the things I, I don't think it says, no, in this paper, it doesn't say these are computer generated. Don't try to do them by hand. But, uh, I get a book that is, this is, this paper led me to a book that basically said, this is a math book. So get with the program. And, uh, it, it said, don't even try this, uh, on your own. You have to do a computer rendering of it because the shapes are very specific. The angles are very specific. They lied though. I did it by hand. I'm tough that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the uh, in Figure fourteen in this paper, you see two lines that look very similar. You can see subtle differences between them, but very similar. But they say if you crease them tightly enough, you see a pretty dramatic difference in the actual folded work. Fourteen. This is the the one column design. Oh yes, I tried that one, and it was weird because it is just two lines that. I mean, it's straight, straight, a little bit of a curve, straight, straight. And then underneath, it's the same curve, just split by a little bit. And you end up making this pleat in the paper that somehow leads you to looking like you have a, a like a part of a flower in a vase. It's the stem of a flower in a vase. It's, Wait, that, that inner column is part of the paper, not something else? Oh, yeah, that's part of the paper. See, that that's not... Some of these are intuitive. You look at them and go, okay, yeah, I can see how the, this moves into that shape. But with that one, with these two very simple curves, that doesn't make any sense at all. So I'm sorry, this doesn't, this doesn't work. <laughs> Not physically possible. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is all lies. I made that one, didn't I show it to you? I don't think you showed me that one. I think I made that one out of origami paper, so it was pretty crappy. Very well, even there, that's one where you, you start thinking about taking just a, a pretty simple you know, sedimentary section and applying some forces to it. And you get all these crazy compound looking folds that are a nightmare to try to map in the field and figure out what happened and to see just these small differences in these two lines that got creased and what the dramatic effect was. You start saying, okay, maybe I can see how this geology got so complicated so quickly. Yeah. It doesn't, it, it could be instantaneous almost, right? It's something happens to curve these things in a certain way, and then suddenly it settles into this position very quickly. Right. But are there sheets that act like paper where they they want to stay attached? Uh, definitely so. I mean, it, you've got uh, a pretty... They're not, they may violate some... I'm sure they violate some assumptions of the math of adequately thin media compared to its, its length and width. Uh, but I would say if you've got a a nice thick chunky rock unit, a, a big sed section or a big piece of carbonate or even a, a tectonic plate. If you want to go to that level and you're looking at something that's 10 to 40 kilometers thick, uh, that in mass is going to hang together as one sheet. Even if it gets folded. Right. So there are some great, uh, I would definitely encourage folks to look up geologic folds, both from the aerial and sort of the conceptual side view. And you can get these folds that range from, I've got some in hand sample that are a few centimeter scale, all the way up to folds that are many kilometer scale or even larger for tectonic scale. And yeah, these rock units behave as one entity. They don't necessarily split apart. Sure, there is some faulting along the edges of the fold sometimes, uh, but in especially the smaller ones, you don't always see that. I typed it into Google and now I'm looking at a rock that's zigzagged back and forth. It does not look real at all. Yes. <laughs> and th these are even harder to interpret in the field because, so when you've, you've folded your 
your curved crease origami thing, and then you subject it to a hundred thousand years of erosion. And now you've got a completely different cut through this three dimensional surface that was made in a complex way that you don't know. And you have to go back and figure out how that happened. Uh, so when you get a fold that is not perfectly horizontal, uh, the axis of the fold plunges into or out of, comes out of the ground, which is relatively common. You can get some pretty weird surface expressions of that after things have eroded away. Hey, that one looks just like the co- cone one that's in 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 the paper. I'll put those the, in the, the show. The cone notes. reflected seven times? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of these geologic features, you know, I said they're on all scales, uh, when I say a fault, a lot of times you might think of a tectonic fault, right? So say the San Andreas fault, so that's a very atypical fault. Uh, but you would think of something pretty large with lots of displacement on it. Faults can be a few tens of microns thick and have a half a centimeter or a centimeter of displacement on them as well. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting things about the fractal nature of geologic features, uh, but you can have folds large and small, and you can get some things that you shouldn't think rock should be able to do, but over a long enough period of time, uh, rock is able to do it. That's how you get salt plumes that uh, rise, salt rises buoyantly over geologic time and creates all kinds of interesting features in the Gulf that we use as mechanisms to trap oil and uh, extract those resources. So rocks can do some pretty interesting things. And I think sets of geologic units isn't really that much different from sheets of paper. Sweet. That means I win fun, fun paper Friday, right? (laughs) Yeah, I I think you win. This is certainly one of the, uh, I wasn't expecting to be able to tie this to geology initially (laughs) (laughs) papers. And I always try to tie them too to some sort of, I wonder if there's an industrial application, some kind of interesting manufacturing thing where you could use this to, to speed up some manufacturing process. I would, I would think the folks that do, uh, you know, automotive uh, body design would have to be really familiar with this when they're doing, uh, you know, the, the really odd geometries that you'd have in a sports car or something. I think they just stamp them. Do they? Yeah, okay. So they kind of, I don't know if the original, they'd have to do something like this, but, uh, yeah, I think I think they just because they have to make thousands a day, so just when, a, and you can stretch sheet metal too, right? I guess you can stretch rock too, so maybe maybe you can get away with not having exact curves and right. creases. I did see that there was some packaging that used some of these principles, but it was to make the pack packaging prettier. I mean, it, the goal was to make it look fancy, right. I would say if you're if you're making some kind of a shock absorbent packaging, maybe this maybe yeah. this wouldn't be the most efficient way to do it, but maybe it would. I don't know. Uh, buying a flat sheet would certainly be more economical, I would think, than making some kind of custom mold. And I'm sure bending it is easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just need a lot of ballpoint pins. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really fun to talk to both of you. Uh are there any things we should have talked about that we didn't? No, I think this was a, a great discussion of how science actually happens. Yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> and learned a lot from everyone. John, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Well, I guess I would just say, going back to some of the things we were talking about earlier, there's really no substitute for trying something or, or doing something. You may think you know that it should work, or you think you know what you're looking for, but even that that model is going to be incorrect in some way because models are only that, models. So just, I would say, go out and try to measure something or try to do something, uh, even if that's not making uh, a widget that you're going to sell 100 million of or a scientific instrument or whatever. Uh, just start on a project, or if you're me, try to finish one as a goal. Eric, what about you? You know, the, uh, the advice from John there, I think is, is really solid and something I need to remind myself of all the time. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, have overthinking and over planning tendencies, which means I have the perfect job, but, um, you know, the, uh, there's, there's certainly a time for thinking carefully, but, um, 
that uh, that I think comes more when it's time to share your work with others and, and really formalize it. And at this experimental stage, it's so helpful to get moving and uh, um, even, you know, try doing some of that writing down for others along the way. Um, I, I've noticed that when I can when I can get into that mode, I'm uh, I'm actually more efficient at discovering the next thing I need to do because I've actually tried to explain it to someone as well. So, uh, yeah, give it a shot and, and get started. I think that's usually very good advice, both finishing things and getting started. This has been a joint show between the Don't Panic Geocast and Embedded. The hosts of the Geocast are John Lehman, who is with us today, and Shannon Doolin. John is also the founder of Lehman Geophysical. The hosts of Embedded are Elysia White, that's me, and Christopher White. Our guest has been Eric Brennan, Associate Professor of Atmospheric Science at Texas Tech University. It's good to talk to you, John and Eric. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to remind those listeners of Embedded that we're having a party, real life physical in-person party in Aptos, California, that's near Santa Cruz, California, on September 7th. Embedded300.eventbrite.com or you can email us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on embedded.fm and I will send you the link. And now, thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting, and thank you for listening. And thank you for listening to our show. You can contact us at show at don'tpanicgeocast.com. Thank you all, and have a good week. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.